with her being a feminist. Okay, got it. Um, I feel like the overall focus point was the fact that she was a feminist and she was part of the National Association of Colored Women. I didn't even know there was a National Association of Colored Women. Do we even have that today still? Is that still going on? You know, I don't know. I think that would be a, a good thing for you to look into, though. I'm sure a quick Google search kind of gives you some. Let me let me look. Okay. Is the anyone else would want to speak to what they felt the thesis of the text was? Um, I think that the thesis of the statement, I mean the thesis of the statement, okay. <laughs> The thesis of the um the reading was basically just showing that Harriet Tubman wasn't just like Michelle mentioned, wasn't just um the conductor, like the conductor of the Underground Railroad. She had a whole bunch of more accomplishments and a whole bunch more um advancements and much more of a part in a uh in a role in not only African American freedom and African American just voice. But also, like Michelle stated, like women's rights, women's voice. And she was like part of like she was a um civil activist and part of like I forgot what exactly it said in the in the um National in the Association. Yeah. Yeah, the National National Association of Colored Women. And they're still active today, I just saw. Yeah. Well, that's good. <laughs> but um I just feel like it the it was basically just um showing that she's more than just what um history has always kind of told us and kind of just I'm oh, sorry um demeaned her to just this um one accomplishment when she's really been very active and very important in all aspects of African American um freedom and equality. Perfect. Thank you, Shaw. Um, anyone want to speak to what stood out to them in the meeting? What stood out to you? Go ahead, Aziz. Uh, what stood out to me is that they mentioned um, how in the history book, when they were giving her, well, in the history book, when they were mentioning her, they would always say she was illiterate, she couldn't read, she couldn't write. And I feel like it's just kind of, it's kind of messed up how a black woman can never receive her flowers without extra thorns with the flowers because in the sense that this movement that she carried it, it's ob obviously it was highly respected but i feel like she was much more than the underground railroad and her being kind of put just simply in that box just took away from like the greatness and what she like what she's seen in women because I did not know that she was a feminist what well, I I would expect her to you know be for women but I feel like in that time the grand everyone history makes it seem like just the only focus of that time was just slavery and I feel like that's where people get lost in intersectionality because it's like there's so much stuff that goes on within us as people, no matter the time, but how history like relates it, it's always just this is what we were focusing on, and this is like, and I feel like that's another reason why misogyny has like gone so normalized within the black, well, within the society in general, because of our main, the main focal point being race. But yeah, that was my, that was what I got from. Three. Thank you, Zizi. Uh Michelle, you gonna say something? Um, what stood out to me the most was um there was a there was a section on page four and five um where they said that Harry Tubman, who was 80 years old at the time, she was at this convention and um they had named her mother Tubman as um and she held up a firstborn infant um of Ida B. Wells who had given birth earlier that year and presented the young Charles Burnett to the audience as the baby of the association. I thought that was pretty dope. Definitely. You see the elders and then you see the youth, absolutely. 
Yeah. Anyone else want to speak to what stood out to them or uh, what new understandings did they gain about Harriet Tubman from the text? Could I? I, I also wanted to add, I think, was it was it Shy or who spoke earlier? Um, Ziza. Um, hmm? I think it was Aziza who spoke earlier. Aziza. Um, I agree when she said that. Um, what stuck out me the most was that, yeah, when, when you read a, a, the history textbooks, they're so quick to point out that Harriet Tubman was illiterate, that she wasn't smart, but she was an astronomer. That's something that this text points out. Even though she was not uh, literate, she was still an astronomer. She was able to read the stars. How many people can say that they can look out and, and map out the stars? Not many. So to... to to have this this woman who was in fact a genius, to 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 try to downplay her genius, um, I think that was like very whitewashing. But I'm also really happy that in this text they shined a light like she wasn't she wasn't stupid. She she was not only um, smart in getting um, over seventy people uh, freed and ex escaped from the plantation, but she used the the stars like that. Anyone else want to speak to you what stood out or what new revelation they found about Harriet Tubman? All right, so I'll jump into it. Um, before I get into the actual text, I want to provide us with some uh, theoretical frameworks. Um, actually, uh, Aziza kind of touched on one of them, but but I want to get into the first one first. Um, the first of which being uh, fugitivity. Um, write that down, fugitivity. And the fugitivity is the act of stealing oneself, of stealing oneself and remaining in constant flight. So if we're thinking about uh, the plantation society, right, and the plantation society, if you were enslaved, you were property of the owner of that plantation, right? So the moment you decided to try to free yourself or to run off of the plantation, you become in fact fugitive. Give me one second, Michelle. Okay. So this act of fugitivity is not only getting off of the plantation, right? Having the skills and the ability and the capacity to get off of the plantation, but once you're off of the plantation, remaining free, right? So you do know that once someone got off the plantation, they sent the slave catchers after them. They sent the dogs after them. So part of fugitivity is doing things like going through the river or going through the water so that way your scent isn't left so that the dogs can't track you. Part of fugitivity is doing things like um, covering your tracks so that way you leave no footprints behind. Do you want better? Have you ever heard of the food called hush puppies? Anybody heard of that? Okay. Yes. You know where they get hush puppies from? No. When you're on the run and you come across a dog, you feed them the hush puppy so the dog can be quiet. Even hush puppies, this idea of a food, it stems from the act of trying to free yourself and remain free. So fugitivity is the act of stealing yourself and being in constant flight. Now, fugitivity is deeply tied to policing. Why would I say that fugitivity and policing are intertwined? Because police, um, are you speaking in like uh, terms of control or terms of like policing yourself, like discipline? Policing itself, the actual act of policing, the badge and all that, right? Oh, okay. Um, wait, sorry, what was the question again? I almost forgot. Why is fugitivity mm -hmm. and the act of policing intertwined? That's a good question. I got to think about that one. Anyone else? Why is policing and fugitivity intertwined? I feel like policing and um and fugitivity is entwined because while um fugitivity is kind of 
the act of, like you said, stealing oneself and, you know, running away consistently in flight, policing is the complete opposite. It's trying to keep someone in. It's trying to, like, trying to keep them remained in, you know. It's basically, I feel like it's like the counteract of fugitivity. Yes, but so to kind of crystallize it a little bit more, right? Once someone engages in the act of fugitivity, they sent... Um, the slave catcher after them, right? The slave catcher is the original inception of police. That's the origins of policing, to bring this escape property back to the plantation. Before enslavement, there was no concept of policing. Do you want better? Where is the only place in the United States where enslavement is legal? The only place in the United States where enslavement is legal. The 14th Amendment. I'll give you a clue. Wait, uh, as of today? As of today, right now. Nowhere, right? Well, there is, there's still enslavement of the female's reproductive system. No, no, I'm not talking cool. about that. I'm talking about actual physical oh, enslavement. enslavement. Where is it Do one place even... that is legal in our world today, in the United yeah. States today? One place. Is it Mississippi? Nope. Craig, I'm... Go ahead, Nancy. Is it human trafficking? Um, is it jails? Prisons? Nope. Prison. Oh, that is so true. Prisons is the only place where enslavement is legal. So think about this. The origins of policing is to bring those who have tried to escape back to the plantation. The only where currently where you are able to enslave someone is prison. Who takes you to prison? Who is Isa? The motherfucking police. police. The police. Right. So what I'm telling you is their job has not changed. The system of enslavement has not changed. It has evolved into a prison system. Hence, the prison industrial complex. That's our first framework, which is fugitivity, okay? The second framework that I want to think about, and again, this is what Aziza mentioned earlier, this idea of intersectionality. Um, Aziza, can you do me a favor and kind of explain to us what intersectionality is? Basically, like two things that are making you of one. So I'm black and I'm also a woman. Connect the dots, do as you will. Like, you know, it's just, uh, or as I would like to put for my own definition, I would say like two oppressions because as at the moment, I feel like it's kind of starting to go into like what you are oppressed over because like now we, Sorry, I don't want to go too deep, so I'm just going to leave it at that. <laughs> but yeah. Go deep if you want to. Um, but yes, the key is the oppression. Because the way that you stated first, the first time, I'm Black and I'm a woman, that's your positionality, right? That's your positionality. We all have a positionality, right? I'm Black and I'm a man. I'm Black, I'm a man, I'm heteronormative, right? These are my positionality. Now, where intersectionality comes into play is the axis of oppression. So while I'm Black, I'm on the lower end of the racial system of oppression, right? But I'm also a man. So unfortunately, I operate at the higher end of patriarchy. So does that mean that the Black woman is at the lowest patriarchy? The lowest point of intersectionality. I'm sorry, but I've been, I've literally been saying that for the past few weeks now and like hints in all of my answers. Yes, 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 yes. Black women are the most disrespect, disrespected species walking this earth. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Shout out a doubt. Um, so this is the notion of intersectionality. So if we were to complicate it further, right? If you're a black woman who is homosexual, let's say, and who is non-Christian, right? Then you're at the lowest of the lowest of the lowest as it pertains to your intersectionality. That is true. Right? So these are how these different positions that you occupy in a society that is anti-black, 
that is heteronormative, that is Protestant, right? That is Christian. And then if you're all those things, black woman, non-Christian, non-heterosexual and poor, and poor, you're really fucked. So these are how these things and these notions of intersectionality play out, right? And this to me brings us to the activism in the work of Harriet Tubman. So as we all pointed out, right? She's often described as someone who's illiterate, but as the article states, she had a different type of capacity to read. She had a capacity to read the world. She knew how to get into herbs that would heal. She knew how to use the stars that allow her to navigate her way up north. But for me, when I read this, I automatically thought back to week one, when we learned about how the Dogon would be able to climb on the mountaintop and view Siri Star A and Siri Star B with their naked eye. When we learned about how the ancient Kemetics were able to build the, the pyramids and the temples in direct alignment with the star systems. So while this is fascinating and this is brilliant, to me it's not beyond the scope of what African people have always done. And her connection to her Africanness allowed her to have this type of way of reading the world that goes beyond the normative literacy, right? Um, Looking on page three, it says, yet Tubman's role reached far beyond her most famous, famous one as the conductor of the Underground Railroad. She made 13 trips to the South and rescued approximately 70 slaves from the plantation system. According to the most recent biography, biographies, she was also a Civil War, um, excuse me, Civil War veteran, nurse, community organizer, women's suffrage, and border crossing migrant. Now, 13 trips from the South to the North. 70 people rescued. In fact, she's famously quoted for saying, I would have rescued more if they knew they were enslaved. Think about that. I would have rescued more if they knew they were enslaved. So in other words, she like, yo, the train is coming, let's go. Nah, I'm cool. I'm gonna sit right here and continue to pick this cot. Right? This is what well, this is what prevented her from rescuing more than seventy. Go ahead, Michelle. Professor, did she not ever be afraid of those slaves snitching her out? Like she goes to the plantation, and then they're like, she's like, "Come on, let's go," and they're like, "Nah, we good, we good." And then like one of the Uncle Toms be like, "Hey, massa, there's a nigga up here in the plantation trying to uh, take your slaves." So I honestly hold up. Famously, right, she um, she carried a shotgun. She was notorious for carrying the shotgun and to which she would respond, the shotgun is not for the overseer, it's for the enslaved who's seeking to snitch on her. So she had her oh. means of, of dealing with those type of individuals. Oh. Wait, so did she really used to shoot people that tried to go back? That's what she said. Did she kill them? Uh, I, I don't know. I, was, I can't give you any documented evidence of that, but I do know this is what she claimed to do. She's also I, known to put babies to sleep just to prevent them from crying and things of that nature. So I was literally just about to say that. that. I was literally just about to say that. Oh, yes. I know that she put some type of drug. It's like some, it was a herbal drug that gets, it's like amnesia and it knocks them out in seconds. Yeah. So, and, and I mean, like, let, let's think about this, right? Like, like, Practically speaking, okay, 13 trips under the most harshest conditions. Now, this is a time where Black folks can't travel freely. This is a time where women, where women can't travel freely. So it's suspicious for you just to be Black and to be traveling. Then it's doubly suspicious for you to be a Black woman traveling. And if you're caught, it's not like, oh, you messed up, warning. No, nah, they're going to kill you. At the point that you made 13 trips, you're notorious at this point. So Wait, but, uh, what, lengths, what lengths must you go through to make sure that you're safe and the people that you're traveling are safe? 
So yes, I'm going to put that baby to sleep. Yes, motherfucker, I will shoot you if you try to snitch. Because not only does my life depend on it, the people who I'm traveling with, who I ensure their safeties, their life depends on it as well. What are you going to say, Michelle? So, because you, you said that it was very suspicious for you to travel as a black woman. Could you still travel as a black woman if you had papers? Or it was, or was it just the black men that could go off the plantation with papers? So again, hear what I'm saying. It was, even if you were a white woman traveling, mm. it was suspicious, okay. right? So this is regardless of women, this is a time where women could not travel free. Okay. You understand? Okay. Um, and then also, I think within that passage, right, um, veteran and the Civil War, woman suffrage, but this idea of her being a border crossing migrant. Because think about it, what did she do? She took you from the south up north into Canada, right? So you're crossing that border of the United States to go into another territory. This is very um, in line with the modern conversation right now around borders, right? If Biden gets into office, how will he secure our borders? If Trump gets into office, how will he secure our borders? This, this idea or this notion of a coyote, right? Someone who brings people from one part of the country to another part of the country under the radar of government surveillance. Harriet Tubman was doing this, but with a much more sought after cargo. Because do know if you get off this plantation, those plantation owners are mad at the fact that you're gone. Their income depends on it. They take that personal. Um, it says, of course, Tubman herself contributed to his larger-than-life portrait. After attending the NACW convention, Excuse me, Tubman later went on to a women's suffrage meeting in Rochester, New York, in November of 19, sorry, 1896. Led on stage by Susan B. Anthony, the later, the elderly Tubman declared to other appreciative audiences how I was a conductor on the Underground Railroad for eight years. And I can say what most conductors can't say. I never ran a train off track and I never lost a passenger. Eight years, 13 trips back and forth. And you never lost a passenger? Damn near a decade over a dozen trips into enemy territory and into freedom, and you did not lose one person. So I get what y'all saying in the sense of, oh, she's so much more than the Underground Railroad. But hold on. Let's not shit on the Underground Railroad, right? Like, eight years, 13 trips, and no one's lost? That's miraculous alone. In crafting a narrative emphasizing her role as an Underground Railroad conductor, Tubman validated the struggle for women's rights. Moreover, Tubman's story reminded women that if she, a woman, could transgress the race and gender limitations that forbid women from navigating the world and freely crossing borders between North and South, Canada and the United States, and to do so without a man's help, if she, a woman, could lead a successful battle during the Civil War, then surely women deserve the right to vote and the right to full citizenship. Such a complex history seamlessly weaves women's rights and the rights of African Americans. So what she's able to effectively do is use her life as an example to challenge the notions of what women cannot do. So you're saying that women can't travel from the United States to Canada? Well, shit, I did it. Not only did I do it, I took 70 motherfuckers with me and I got them free. So you're telling me women don't have the capacity to vote? That's interesting because I led a battalion in the Civil War. So if me, a woman, could do these things without a man's help, then what can't women do? Why do they not deserve full citizenship? So again, her life as an example to show the dominating patriarchal world the capacity of women. 
Mm -mm. Talks about the borders again. Um, I, we already kind of talked about that. Um, you know, I'm not really interested in the whole uh, YouTube part. That's kind of whack to me. So what we'll do, um, we'll pause there and we'll jump into our fishbowl. Um, again, you could talk about what you wrote in your journal. Um, you could talk about the reading itself. You could talk about what was talked about in your breakout groups or what was mentioned in my um, lecture. Oh, uh, is there any volunteers for fishbowl? I'll volunteer. Delilah, and I think, that, was that you, Michelle? Yes. And we'll get one more. Um, One, one more volunteer? Danny. Okay. So we'll go Delilah, Michelle, and Danny. Uh, Delilah, you go ahead and start us off. Um, On top of everything that we talked about, uh, which I think, especially during that time, is like just a lot out of a single person that's just um amazing but also another thing is i thought it was interesting how it said she was also a civil civil war veteran and nurse uh but i, I thought that was really cool too never talked about it at all good call um thank you delilah uh michelle um i wanted uh i wanted to cover um on a few things where you talked about uh fugitism fugitivity. fugitivity the act of escaping to be free and remaining free i feel like that's i never heard of that like that and i feel like that's not talked enough especially in um the black community when we're talking about our history when we're talking about uh systematic racism and injustices that we're still dealing with today especially just a couple weeks ago there was a black woman who was shot to death by a police officer uh, and she was standing right be right behind her door and this man impulsively two of them impulsively just opened fire and um when when you mentioned fugitism oh, what is it again fugitivity fugitivity i my mind automatically went to that that incident and i'm like yeah especially when you ask that, that question about policing and the and and um fugitivism that I can't even say it. <laughs> it how they intertwine. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Dan. Um. So like while I was reading it, like at the beginning of the thing when they were talking about how like Harriet isn't really mentioned in mainstream feminism, like I started to think about this TikTok video. Well, not even like a TikTok. It was like. A series of TikTok videos, like a, it was like a bunch of black women basically saying how like mainstream feminism isn't really meant for black women, and um, that just made me think about that and how like um, I feel like while Harry is also black, like she's also a woman, so I feel like there's a whole different perspective with like that she has to offer being a part of both communities. Yeah, uh, you know, th thank you, Danny. Um, I had meant to get into this, and I, I it slipped my mind. Um, just thinking about one of the first things that Michelle said when she came on the line was, yo, I didn't know that Harriet Tubman was a feminist. I'm like, eh, hold on, because to Danny's point, right, there's a vast distinction between what Harriet Tubman wanted and the desires of mainstream feminism or how white women perform feminism, to, to just put it bluntly, right? Um, what I find in the way that white women perform feminism, they seek to replace men as the power structure. Does this make sense, right? So instead of creating a world of equality where everyone is equal, I want to take the place of men and put white women in particular in power, okay? And Historically, when women like Harriet Tubman try to integrate this feminist movement, their issues of race are pushed to the side. They're not recognized. So what has to happen and what begins to happen, especially when you get into the spaces like the 1980s, when Alice Walker coins the term womanism, which is more um, centered and catered to the Black experience. Womanism doesn't seek to replace the men as power. Womanism seeks to create a space to where everyone is equal. 
Womanism does not vilify the black man. Womanism recognizes that the black man also must be revolutionized and reformed in a way that he should recognize his patriarchy and fight alongside women. So it's, in, it's vastly important to understand the distinctions between mainstream feminism and notions like womanism. Gianna? Um, I wanted, I talked about this in my breakout room, but I wanted to also ask you about it to seek more clarity. Um, at the bottom of like page seven, it talks about um, the rape of Harriet Tubman. And I felt like from what I read, my takeaway was how like black women are sexualized and portrayed today and how um, just why do we see them so negatively? And like why somebody would see someone as Harriet Tubman and just come up with something like that. Like of all the amazing things she's done, why would you degrade her in that form to like say something so horrible? So I just wanted clarity as to why um, people like the, it says like the, in 2013, like the Harriet Tubman, like sex tape and yeah. like the rape of Harriet Tubman. Well, I, I could put it to you like this. Why are why a few years ago were motherfuckers walking up empty crates and trying to walk down empty crates? Why do we have these trends on social media? It's for likes, it's for attention. The people who came up with this thought that this would be something that was funny, that would garner them some type of comedic attention, right? Um, a joke made in poor taste. Now, I think the more interesting thing is you don't see this about individuals like Malcolm X. You don't see things like this when it comes to Martin Luther King. And, and as the story goes, Martin Luther King was into all kinds of women, as the story goes. But you don't see him displayed in this type of way. So this goes back to what Aziza and uh, Shai were pointing us back to in the beginning of the conversation today, the disrespect that is offered to Black women. And Fundamentally, how could you situate any type of sexual encounter between a plantation owner and a enslaved woman in other, any other context outside of rape? There is no way that you can consent under those circumstances. So to make light of that, to me, it just goes back to the point that she was making, the disrespect of Black women. Go ahead, Aziza. I noticed uh, in your lecture, you brought back how uh, I talked about her not being, well, the Underground Railroad and like, yeah, that. I think I think more so I was saying that with her being such a feminist and what you just mentioned about mainstream feminism <clears throat> doesn't allow Black women to exist anywhere. I think I was more so saying that with her achievements and with all of the great things that she has done, it's still like a, thanks, I'm gonna take this, fuck you, whatever. Like, I think that's more so what it was because, and not saying the, rail, the Underground Railroad shouldn't be held in high regard, yes, obviously. But I'm saying that, what, as you said, she was probably fighting for a different cause than what Susan B. Anthony is somebody was Absolutely. fighting for as like they would put in the you know in the yeah. feminist movement so I feel like it's more of like a it's not acknowledging her feminism and not and I feel like with a, a, an opinion with, her, with Harriet Tubman I feel like a lot of people use her looks and her complexion and take away from her womanhood in a sense uh, I see it a lot in a lot of different uh social media jokes or you know stuff like that I see it a lot and I see it as like normalized now like they use her looks to kind of take away from her womanhood and I feel like that's another thing that we have that's like it's another current standing thing that we have like a woman must be judged upon her looks to get the to get some type of recognition like it's fucked up honestly because even with a woman being so innovative as Harriet Tubman like no like uh Michelle said who the fuck can read the stars from like an enslaved mindset no one can think to do that because that was looked at as you're crazy. what 
it still looks that like I talk about my zodiac around the house and I'm still like what the fuck my my family don't like that so I think that sorry I took a whole like <laughs> the engine but I think that it's like a slap in the face essentially but yeah and I think too like let's uh, let's contextualize her lack of normal literacy right like let's talk about that she comes from a plantation society in a plantation society, if you get caught with a piece of paper, you're losing your hand, right? I'll give you an example of a book called School Clothes written by Jarvis Gibbons, where he tells the story of a, a gentleman by the name of Papa Dallas, who was on the plantation and the overseer, the plantation owner caught him reading. So the plantation owner proceeded to pour acid in his eye to ensure that he will never read again. Not fuck? only that he will never read again, but that when other Africans on the plantation seen him, they knew not to read again. So then you wonder why she's framed as illiterate. Of course, she's naturally illiterate in these terms. It was illegal for you to own paper. It was illegal for you to try to read. So I think that's... But, I think what you just mentioned is like a, a good yeah. uh, oh sorry, go ahead. No, I was agreeing with you. No, go. It's like a good way to pivot to uh kind of last week's conversation where uh we spoke about um this idea of already starting, like uh already starting and like everyone else already has a head start, you know? Like yeah, everybody else around her was uh and I'm talking about like the white American, like heterosexual male, yeah, they're all literate and they have this knowledge. It's because they didn't start uh, at the bottom the way um, these slaves did. And then I also wanted to mention that I think we didn't directly say like why um, Harriet Tubman's like achievements fell under the cracks. I think it might be a symptom of um, like white America uh, trying to uh, hide the truth of what um, of how like America came to be because they know it'll paint them in this like really bad picture. Uh, yeah, I don't know if you guys want to speak on that. Absolutely. And I think it, it does so in two lights, right? Not only does it talk to the way that America has marginalized African people, but also how America has marginalized women. So we really can't have this story be told because now we have two communities upset with us, right? So the works and the exploits of Harriet Tubman must be swept under the rug. Could we also mention that like how during slavery, um, the early slave days, they had white indentured service, poor, illiterate as well, that were like working with slaves and working with slaves, living with them. And and like it, it was due to the upper class white men that were afraid of a revolt. They made white people believe that they were even superior to slaves. Like I couldn't help but think about that. And I'm like, that shit is fucking wild. Like they, they were literally in the same boat as black people, and they think that they were no better than them just because of their skin tone. So let, let's let's um, air that out a little bit more. You're right, Michelle. So actually, the first people who were brought to be enslaved in the United States were or white European um, criminals, um, though those who the the European society did not want, right? But what happens is in a society to where if you're a white male, you get land and um, people to work your land. What's the difference between someone who is an indentured servant and a white male, right? So if I'm a white male and I'm an indentured servant, I'm just going to walk off the plantation and say, yo, give me my land, right? So that system did not work due to that technicality. So mm -hmm. the next one that they tried were the, what you may call Native Americans, right? But oh, yeah, that's right. what the Native Americans did, and I, and I think this is a strategic tactic. I genuinely believe this. I have no evidence of this, but I, I genuinely believe this. When they were put to work, oh, it's too hot. They didn't have the physical capacity to work. Now, to me, that's smart as fuck. Mm, I ain't about to do this. I'm about to just pass out. So you can't think I could work. So when that failed, then they begin to go into West Africa, kidnap Africans and bring them into the West and begin this process. Then we begin to talk to talk about racializing enslavement. 
where if you have a black melanated epidermis, you are con preconditioned to this position as enslaved. And now what they begin to do is for the poor whites, this is a level of distinction that you have. It's a level of class elevation that you have to let you think that you're better than them because of you don't have the same skin color as them. But didn't they have poor, like in somewhat enslaved white people working alongside slaves? They tried it. They tried it and it didn't work. And so what ended up happening, they had to bring in more Africans to fill the work quota. Mm. Joseph Stewart, what you think? Um, I mean, obviously it's like a, it's just like, that was going to be a hard thing to like, to like stomach and accept just because like the, like the color of somebody's skin is like a determining factor or something like, something so extreme and so like, like revolting to like, to uh, just to go through. So it's like the fact that there's indentured servants that are basically the same, like social status, I guess, but being treated better uh, because of like a, a similarity and just as, as like, as like basic as skin color. It's just like, it's really hard to comprehend that as like someone that lives through that because at, like today, obviously we don't really have that. So you can't really comprehend like on a first person, first, 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 first person perspective because it's like you don't really have that experience of being discriminated so hard that you're literally it's like a life and death type of situation um in certain aspects so like you're not going to get like a white person that's sla enslaved back then isn't going to get like like tortured because they're reading but like a black person back then would literally like was literally getting killed because they're reading or had to add paper so it's just like the like the um what's it called like the just like the livelihood of having to live through that every single day is kind of like, it's really hard to like, like comprehend that kind of thing. You're right, Joseph. But but what I don't want us to do is um, place that in the past, right? California, 6% of the population in California is black, right? 6%. We make up about 60% of the prison population. Oftentimes, those who are in prison are not guilty of anything. Again, the one place where enslavement is legal is in prison. We do know that prisons are privatized, correct? You know what I mean when I say that prisons are privatized? That means that a corporation owns the prison, which means that the prisoner is the commodity for that corporation. So the corporation is dependent upon bodies being in those cells. A couple of years ago, they put an end to a law that was in New York called stop and frisk. Is anybody familiar with the idea of stop and frisk? So the idea of stop and frisk is if you're walking down the street, a police sees you, he can stop you and frisk you. If you have contraband on you, then you're going to jail. Who do you think was getting stopped and frisked? Black people. Absolutely. So yes, this plantation system as we read about it is historical, but it's also very modern and contemporary. They had found a profound way to shift it into this thing that we call the prison system. If you're in jail, you have to do labor. So corporations like Victoria's Secret will outsource their labor and have the prisoners making them draws that y'all be wearing because it's a cheap labor source. Companies like Boeing Airport or Boeing Air um, Industries, right? They'll have the prisoners build their seats and in their internal air mechanisms, right? Because that's a cheap labor source. Do you want better? A couple years ago, when there was a fires going on in Northern California, right? They let the prisoners out to go fight the fires. But if those prisoners were to receive parole, they would not be able to be firefighters because what? They have felons. So it's okay for you to go risk your life to fight these fires for free. But if you try to pivot that into an occupation, 
ain't gonna ride. So again, yeah, these things are historical, but they have very real life consequences in our now. Don't believe that uh, white folks don't do crime. That don't make sense. But if you were to look at the prisons, that's what you would think. Now, that could be a case of a crime-free people or a case of a criminal system that is biased. What do you think to be true? So, for... Bye. Yeah, absolutely. 